You can bet on every Wednesday morning. The people of Higgins Beach will show up. I think I would go for a chocolate sugar thing. For their donuts. It's just nice, it's old fashioned. And I think that's the important thing. That's beautiful. The weekly breakfast tradition brings the seasonal and the seasoned to the clubhouse. Yeah, everyone looks forward to it, and I do think she's a big part of it. Just look to the back corner. Absolutely. Well, we yes, have at read, the wall. I have read the high to find the woman who helps get them there. And I love it. It's the best job anyone could ever have. At 78, Barbara O'Brien is the oldest serving member on the Higgins Beach Association Board. That's what makes you young. I have a lot of things I do on the beach. But there's one thing she does that stands out from the rest. Barbara, she loves the talking car. Wednesday, Wednesday morning breakfast, breakfast is 9 o'clock at the clubhouse with coffee, juice, donut, or a muffin for $2. Every summer, once a week for 30 years. So Come and bring a friend. Mrs. O'Brien keeps everyone in the loop. How are you, Christine? As she loops around the neighborhood. Wednesday morning breakfast is 9 o'clock at the clubhouse. Making community announcements. This is the last breakfast, please. Hi. In her talking car. Have that last cup of coffee together. Somebody said, you should have a recording. I said, no, you don't need a recording. You just, you need to do it the yourself. Gather your friends and let's have that last cup of coffee together. She inherited the job from a neighbor who started the talking car more than 45 years ago. For two dollars. Mrs. O'Brien still uses the original sound system. Got a little crack in it, but that's all. She has some rules. Hi guys, how are you? No one else can use the microphone. This is the last breakfast of the year. But she's generous in every other way. Hi Marilyn, I'll see you for breakfast. I love the people. I love the kids. When they're hopping and jumping and they just love to see you. Um, it just warms my heart. Wednesday morning breakfast is 9 o'clock at the clubhouse. The neighbors she loves love her right back. Thank you, Barbara. Salt, Very salt good. Of the the earth. salt of the earth, friend. You never meet anyone like Barbara, ever. She doesn't miss a child. If she knows them, she calls them by name. Hi, Elda. Hello. How are you? Good. And I might not know all the names, but I know about them. That one time I knew something about everybody on the street. The area has changed over the years, but the voice of Higgins Beach has not. Oh, Michael, I see you. <laughs> Everybody wants it. I've already had people say, oh, and you now, I want to do this and I want to do that. And I, well, you're not going to do it now because I've got it. <laughs> so even though it's her last drive of the season. What about bacon and eggs? No bacon and eggs. <laughs> Sorry. You can bet the people of Higgins Beach will know about the donuts every Wednesday morning. Thanks to Mrs. O'Brien. Wednesday morning breakfast. And her talking car. With coffee, juice, donut, or a muffin. I will do it as long as I can. Yep. Even if somebody has to drive me. <laughs> In Scarborough, Jana Barnello. Nine o'clock at the clubhouse. CBS 13 News. And have that last cup of coffee together. Nine one one. What's the address of your emergency? It's all of us right here. It is a far cry from Quran's new reality. Oh, I like this one too. Do we need a medic? Uh, 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 yeah, I think so. A darkness settled over Quran's life April twelfth. Uh, we're falling back out of the The woman he admired most yeah. never returned home. It was just, you know, it was different from that day on out. Karan remembers his mother, Tanika Lacey, leaving early that spring morning. But my mom was like, I mean, ear to ear smile, like. The last time to see her smile. Yeah, I'll rush down there to the emergency room. Lacey crashed her SUV on Interstate 71 North near Moffrey Stadium. She's gonna be in the far right lane. Columbus police say she crossed two lanes before hitting the concrete barrier. The impact sent her back into a guardrail. She got into it. And police looking for a reason why. A truck of some sort came through here and dropped uh, some uh, stuff on the road, which probably contributed to this whole thing. That same morning and minutes before Lacey crashed, an alarm sounds on Coda Bus 1031. Coda 1031 block 10204. Um, on 
but was um, disabled a uh, radiator leak of some sort on the back. Officers follow the trail. We have a Coda uh, bus off the exit ramp of Cook Road. Uh, I just spoke with the mechanics here and they said it was leaking coolant down the freeway. Lacey died in the hospital a week after her crash. Columbus police say she skidded on antifreeze from a Coda bus. Um, it's the safety. Um, it's, you know, that could have been, you know, my mom, you know, my wife, anyone. Her death prompted two CODA employees to step forward despite fear of losing their jobs. Before that happened, I always had to worry about if I was traveling down the freeway with my family, you know, being next to a CODA bus, something happening. CODA maintenance records for bus 1031 show a coolant leak the morning Lacey crashed. An old and worn hose couldn't be repaired on the road. Putting our drivers at risk, putting public the public at risk. So it, it um, you know, starts weighing on you. In late July, our camera captured another broken down bus. CODA says its engine blew during a test drive. Maintenance records show this bus has had coolant line problems with leaks documented since last August. The bus drivers have um, their pre-trip inspection, but this is, you know, um, do the lights work? Are the wiper blades good? They don't know what's going on under the bus. Low coolant or coolant leaks could cause a bus to overheat or just shut down in the middle of the road or highway. One employee says some workers weren't trained to properly add fluids, but both say that wasn't the only reason for the problem. Our trainer had us uh, pressure testing the system at too high of a pressure. Six on your side investigates wanted to review a year's worth of maintenance records for CODA's entire fleet. Its legal counsel first told us our request is extremely large and asked us to narrow it down. We requested tow records. They showed more than 235 tows from June 2017 to this June. I don't know if it's normal or not normal. What I can tell you is vehicle maintenance issues are pervasive across the transit industry altogether. I poured over records for 15 additional buses towed three to four times in that year. Some noted failed brake tests, oil leaks, and expired or nearly expired fire extinguishers. All had low coolant or coolant leaks, several overheated. Eight had been marked for a coolant hose campaign. They couldn't get the, the inspections done, let alone have people doing you know, hose campaigns. The CODA employees say the transit agency fell behind on safety inspections. They're set up so that we can check just like um, fire extinguishers, um, make sure everything under the bus steering wise is, is safe. That employee says problems with inspections being past due began last December. It wasn't just one bus, it became multiple and multiple buses that, you know, things were getting overlooked. CODA operates more than 300 buses daily. Over 40% had past due 6,000 mile preventative maintenance inspections from December 2017 to May 2018. Sometimes buses do run past due of routine maintenance and typically that's because the bus is out in service runs past that mileage threshold, comes back to our facility, and then is addressed right away. CODA's Patrick Harris admits coolant issues repeatedly come up, but maintains they are not specific to CODA. I feel confident putting my family on CODA buses every day. The police report stated Lacey did not properly control her SUV and had unsafe tires. She also wasn't wearing a seatbelt. The coroner ruled Lacey's death an accident. But that's my mom, you know I mean? That was my... That's my best friend, man. His best friend, his mother, mm -hmm. gone. He now tries to take her place. I, I honestly, I ain't gonna be able to fill those shoes, but I can carry the rock. It makes me cry. <laughs> and when I leave the nursing home, um, sorry. Memories she'd rather not have about her grandpa. He is 90 years old. He is a uh, Navy vet. His wife just passed away back in July. Um, and the conditions he's living in are not acceptable. Dawn shared with us this picture she took. We found a huge um, red 
sore uh, that covered about half of his back. She says that is how she and her mom found her grandpa when they visited him last month at the manor at White Hall. He kept saying that he was um, aching and hurting and um, that's when my mom noticed a kind of yellow, like kind of oozy film on the back of his pillow. Dawn snapped more pictures. She says these show a filthy air conditioner filter, food crumbles on the floor, and a yellow substance on his bed remote. I don't feel like it's sanitary enough to have my nine-year-old trying to sit on the floor <laughs> play games. The next day, Dawn says his bed sheets didn't look fresh and his sore had worsened. Not only did he have a complete yellow coating all over his blankets from the ooziness and the pussiness of his back, but he was also bleeding at this point. Dawn says um, she was told by a nurse her grandpa, who has dementia, was being treated for a yeast infection and assured her he would be turned every hour for better airflow. And I sat with my grandpa who was laying on his back for over an hour and I said, have they turned you today? And he said no. And he said, in fact, my arm is burning really bad right now. Dawn says a doctor at the nursing home later revealed tests showed her grandpa had a staph infection. The next day he was in the hospital. Dehydration, uh, he has pneumonia on top of it and also dry kidneys. Dawn's sister filed a police report against the nursing home alleging elder abuse and neglect. Whitehall police say the case was turned over to the state long-term care bureau. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. I don't see how people could allow that. We asked what the Ohio Department of Health has done. They wouldn't tell us if they looked into this specific complaint, but did investigate a complaint around that time and didn't find evidence to support it. Yet surveyors did find deficiencies that led to eight citations. Among others, lack of reference checks for state tested nurse aides and accuracy of records. The manor at Whitehall has until October 11th to submit its plan for corrections. Ideally, we want everybody to get great care. Susan Marshall is with the Ohio Coalition for Adult Protective Services, which puts families in touch with the right people to get help for a loved one. And when nobody comes for the whole shift, that's pretty telling. Marshall says families should document everything. The more details you can give, the easier it's going to be, the faster it's going to be to get a change. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uses a five-star system to rate all nursing homes based on health care inspections, staffing, and quality of care. Right now, the manor at Whitehall is a one-star nursing home. For that to be okay in society to me is not okay. The same facility had been on a federal watch list, but this January, CMS says the nursing home graduated from its special focus facility program. Six on your side investigates press the manor at Whitehall for answers about the recent allegations and its one star rating. So I'm trying to reach the director. On that day, an HR rep told us the director was out of town. The next day, we called. A receptionist told us we're not welcome on their property. A lawyer for the nursing home's owner, Sabre Healthcare, reached out to me. He sent this statement. At all times, the facility acted in the best interest of its residents and promotes their health, safety, and welfare. A unitary star rating determined from afar by folks who may not have ever visited the facility does not accurately reflect the quality of care the facility provides and the number of positive outcomes encountered by residents and their families. If I could have them shut down, I would have them shut down. Dawn says her grandpa is out of the hospital and back at the manor at Whitehall. She quit her job to spend what little time she may have with him. He'll tell me stories of times he was in the Navy. Um, and those are my favorite because those I can pass down to my, my child, so. She says she can't sit idle and watch him whittle away in pain. I think some laws need to be changed. I think that's probably going to be our best avenue at this point. And my grandpa will probably be gone by the time anything happens, but you know what? If we can save somebody else, I think that'll be fine. This isn't a movie, this is really happening. The streets of Columbus, maybe even your street. We look for human trafficking wherever we go. Members of the Ohio Investigative Unit focused on offenses related to liquor, tobacco, and food stamps. 
now also looking beyond those issues for victims of human trafficking. It could be a carry out that's on complaint for food stamp violations. And when we're in that area investigating that complaint, we'll also be looking for human trafficking because we know how prominent it is um, in areas now. Prominent enough for Ohio to rank fourth in the nation for the number of reported cases. This activity doesn't just happen at night. No, and it's during the day too. We ride along with an undercover agent as the sun goes down. We're surrounded by a fairly busy street, neighborhoods, and this activity is happening around the corner. Right. These agents are trained to look at our community with a different set of eyes. We broaden our focus on more than just the initial complaint um, in order to, to help save these victims. When they identify a victim, agents work to connect them with advocacy groups specifically trained in human trafficking cases. Many victims much younger than you might think. The average age for a human trafficking victim is 13. You heard right. 13. Stephanie Rollins lived it. At the age of 12, I ran into my human trafficker. She thought he was her boyfriend, that he loved her. He kept the alcohol and drugs flowing, getting her hooked. I felt that I owed him whatever he asked of me to do, I did. What followed was a life on the streets. I'm over here, I'm doing what I know. If, you know, it's, it wasn't nothing abnormal. I've been doing it all my life. Cocaine to heroin, looking to numb the pain of life she says was eating her alive. Stephanie remembers the moment she turned to a different power. God, please help me. Help me put people in my life to show me how to live life because I don't know how. Now five years clean to the day. She transformed her life. Stephanie works at the Peer Center and devotes time each week to share her story with other young human trafficking victims. I've been there in different ways, shapes, and forms, but if I can just say, oh, honey, honey, please don't. This is what happened to me. It's an important message. The stories that we hear from children are absolutely horrendous. Brooke Pollard is the resource coordinator for Grace Haven, a nonprofit in Columbus that focuses on the 12 to 17 year old victims of human trafficking. And what she hears from those young women is shocking. When I talk to the girls that we serve in our house and I ask what kind of men are purchasing sex from you and they say these are doctors, these are prominent figures, these are lawyers, these are politicians, these are salesmen, these are businessmen, these are people who are are very well known in the community who think that they can get away with it, that this is a victimless crime, and that they can, just like you can go to a vending machine and buy a Coke or buy a bag of chips, you can go and buy sex on your lunch break. It's a cycle the Ohio Investigative Unit hopes to break. I want people to know that this is very real. Captain Gary Allen, the commander of the unit, believes their agents are already making a difference with this new emphasis on human trafficking. When you protect and serve, that's what you want to do. You want to protect and serve. You want to help people. So every night, the unit continues its patrols, looking not just for suspects, but also victims. Human trafficking occurs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We really do have to keep our eyes open, and we really have to be on alert and aware of what's going on around us. And those who work directly with victims know it will take the awareness of our entire community to make a meaningful difference. As long as you have a demand and people want to buy sex from children, somebody will supply you with child victims. As a survivor of child sex trafficking, Stephanie is now excited for the future, for a life she never thought she'd have. I had no idea. I had no idea life could be this free. We're doing this for the Boys and Girls Club. You can see there are quite a few entrants, and uh, so it's the first year for us, but it's going well so far. I think it's very cool. Yeah, I never saw anything like this growing up. <laughs> Cycling for me was always a sport that was not accessible. This is cool. Get people interested, get kids interested, get them riding. 
we have some immigrants that have never seen a bike race in their life. So for them, it was really exciting. It's, it's very cool. i never seen this before. I'm amazed. Little kids getting into this, so it's a, it was a fun event. Yes, you were 19 to go, 19 to go. We're, we're having a good time. This is all about family, pretty much. Family and friends, you know? Push it, guys, push it! Well, no, we're friends, but, you know? It's like a family. It's like a family. <laughs> you got away from him, brother. You got away from him. Come on. And we got away from him. Let's go, Let's go, 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 go. Look, look, look. Yeah. He's in the front. He's in the front. He has to buy you guys beer now. I know. And we got a lot of people coming out um, and watching. We had people hanging out windows and cheering. And Come on, come on, come on. Little kids getting into this, so it's a, it was a fun event. of excitement. Yeah, been going on all day. Now lap, last lap, there they go, there they go. Yeah, I'd planned on bringing the grandkids to see this, but they had a family reunion. But I said, I'm going. When I plan on an event, I'm going no matter what. Here's the winner right here. Yeah, zip car. There's your finish. Awesome. Well, that wraps up today's racing, and uh, a fun time was had by all.